Hello, I'm Jenna Colaza. I am in the Sales and Marketing Department at Academic Studies Press, and I'm here in our Boston office today, and I'm joined virtually by Lena Bernstein and Angela Brindlinger. Uh, we're here to discuss Lena's new book, Magda Nachman, An Artist in Exile, uh, which recently, this year, came out from Academic Studies Press, and um, we're here to discuss the book. Lena Bernstein taught Russian and Comparative Literature at Franklin and Marshall College. She is the author of Gogol's Last Book and numerous articles on Russian art, literature, and culture. She recently curated an online exhibit on Magda Nachman for Moscow State Museum of Oriental Cultures, and she has prepared a Russian-language version of Magda Nachman, an artist in exile, which is now available from our Russian-language series, Contemporary Western Rusistica. Angela Breitlinger has written, edited, and translated numerous books and articles about Russian literature, most recently uh, Russian Cuisine in Exile by Pyotr Weil and Alexander Guinness, which she co-translated with Thomas Fierick, and she has taught several generations of students at Ohio State University. She is also the editor of our new series, Modern Biographies, uh, and the first book in that series is Magda Nachman. So I will hand it over to Angela and she can tell us a little bit more about the series. Thank you so much, Jenna. It's such a delight to work with you again. We did a little video um, conversation about Russian cuisine in exile in Boston at um, a one of our uh, national conferences a few years ago. And so it's nice to see you again. Um, this series, Modern Biographies, comes out of my longstanding uh, interest in biography, uh, particularly in the biographies, of course, of Russian writers and the use of those biographies uh, for cultural and political reasons. Uh, my own first book has just come out in the uh, Western Rusistica um, series in Russian. Um, it was called Writing a Usable Past, uh, Russian Literary Biography, 1917 to 1937, when it came out with Northwestern in 2000, many, many years ago. Um, the book is now available in Russian, and I'm excited about that because I get to engage with Russian scholars of biography. And that's what we're doing also, of course, with Magda Nachman. Um, and we, we here in the United States um, are... Uh, particularly interested in those cross-Atlantic uh, conversations. So I think that this biography series will help with that. But the goal with modern biographies really was to found a series to, um, in a way, bring some of the Russian writers and, and uh, cultural figures to an American, or at least an English-speaking audience. Um, I had aspirations of uh, kind of revisiting the classics. But one of the things that I have found, which is really interesting, is that scholars don't want to write biographies of people that everybody knows about. Scholars want to dig into archives. Scholars want to find new ways to look at uh, the lives of people that we know about, uh, but more importantly, too, the lives of people who have sometimes been uh, lost to history in one way or another. So we have several uh, biographies that are in uh, process that are being written, uh, some of more famous Russian figures, some of less famous Russian figures, or figures, for example, who are quite famous in Russia but have not gotten a proper uh, hearing in the United States. For example, uh, Jason uh, Merrill is writing a biography of Fyodor Sologub. Uh, who is, of course, a very important uh, turn of the century Russian writer, but not somebody that is uh, that trips off the tongue like a Pushkin or a Dostoevsky here in the United States. Um, so the modern biographies is morphing. Um, it will include some of these more famous uh, names. It will also include new names. And that is why I'm so excited uh, that the first book in the series is Magda Nachman, An Artist in Exile. It is such a beautiful book. It has... Um, such a journey that the not just Magda's journey but Lena's journey is an essential part of the book and that too I think is is maybe the modern part of modern biographies when we think about what a biography is uh, we know that it's uh, it can be um, more uh, data focused it can be more um, thoughtful 
um, or creative in some cases. Uh, certainly when I study bi Russian biographies, one of the things that I have found is that they vary uh, significantly um, in what they are like, uh, in what the author finds and seeks in her or his subject. Um, in many cases, those journeys seem to parallel each other. You can see that in some ways a biography is autobiographical, um, which is why uh, this book, which talks about Lena and Magda uh, really fits into that tradition. So I guess I would really like to turn things over to Lena and hear more about her process. And then we'll have uh, some more uh, conversation afterwards. Lena? Thank you, Angela, for this generous introduction. And thank you, Jenna, for organizing this conversation. Um, I would like to uh, use my PowerPoint. Um, so I, I actually, I have a few remarks about my book and I want to present it um, in a nutshell. So, so to speak, just a few words uh, and show you a few pictures. Uh, so Jenna uh, and I, I believe Angela also showed you the cover of, uh, of the book. Uh, and this is the cover of my book, with, with which, uh, with the cover, I'm very pleased. It's very elegant, uh, I think. Um, I began working on the biography of Magda Nachman quite by chance. Uh, a colleague had transcribed some of Magda's correspondence while working on a different project and suggested that I might be interested in looking into it. And I was, I was very interested. It turned out that my investigation into the life of this forgotten artist uh, was in tune with the zeitgeist. Um, as I mentioned before in our private conversation, um, in recent years, cultural historians have been at work restoring the names of forgotten Russian artists and forgotten works of Russian art that had disappeared or gone underground um, in the years, um, in, a, in the early years of the Soviet state and remained hidden throughout the Soviet period. Um, so Magda belongs to the generation of Russians born at the turn of the 20th century, who were driven by political cataclysm into obscurity, exile, and in some cases, death. Uh, as such fates went, however, Magda's was rather unusual. In Russia, we find her in the circle of the Silver Age poets and artists um, at the Crimean Dacha of the poet Maximilian Baloshin in Koktebel. Um, there she painted a portrait of Marina Tsvitaeva, and here is the portrait, portrait, the only oil portrait of the poet painted in her lifetime. 20 years later, she produced a pastel portrait of the writer Vladimir Nabokov in Berlin. Um, and at the same, at the time of her death in India in 1951, she had become a recognized painter of Indian subjects. Um, known especially as a remarkable portraitist and a mentor to the rising generation of Indian modern artists. And this is one of magnificent, I think, examples of her portraiture. Magda survived the Russian revolutions of the 1917 and the Civil War in, um, and in uh, 1922 escaped to Germany. She got out of Germany shortly after Hitler came to power. And then she experienced the stormy transition to independence in India. So Magda's biography gave me the opportunity not only to reintroduce a forgotten artist and her work, uh, but to write about the time that, that shaped her, uh, about the fateful events of the first half of the 20th century at which she was present. Um, using letters, diaries, archival materials, and interviews with those who knew her, um, I was able to create or come up with a patchwork, uh, alas, full of holes, uh, of her life. Uh, one important topic of my book is the Zvantseva Art School in the St. Petersburg, in St. Petersburg, which Magda attended in the years 1907 to 1913. She and her fellow students formed a tightly knit band, calling themselves Constellation Leo in honor of their great teacher, Leon Bakst. The school, the teacher, and her 
France played a pivotal role in Magda's artistic and professional development. It was there that she acquired her artistic vision and determination to pursue a career as a painter. Having set out on the, that path, Magda persevered and against all odds, and the odds were great, gained a measure of success, especially in India. The life for which Magda had prepared herself was violently disrupted by the revolution of 1917 and the Russian Civil War, at which time she was living in Moscow. Unable to support herself in a city cold of cold and hunger, she was driven into the Russian countryside where she led a peripatetic existence. Magda's presence in the provinces gave me the opportunity to write about Russian provincial culture at the time of the civil war, which is an immensely interesting topic. Urban refugees brought high culture um, to the villages and small towns um, on unprecedented scale. There was a proliferation of people's theaters in one of which Magda was the costume and set designer and producer concerts of classical music, as well as lectures on religion, literature, politics, and many other topics. All this was reflected in the provincial press in a language um, that was remaking itself in a way that George Orwell would have recognized. Magda's letters from all the places of her refugee existence are living documents of the epoch. Back in Moscow in 1920, Magda met and married the prominent Indian nationalist M.P.T. Acharya, an Indian Brahmin who had come to Bolshevik Russia in search of ideological and financial support for the struggle for Indian independence. And um, here is um, a portrait, a photographic portrait of him. Um, he also took uh, part uh, in the second uh, Congress of uh, the Communist International. And here he is luckily looking back into the camera and at us. And here is Lenin and Stalin. And you can recognize many faces in this uh, presidium uh, of, the, of the Congress in, in Smolny. But um, it didn't take long for him to become thoroughly disillusioned with the Bolsheviks' methods of exercising power. In the fall of 1922, Magda and Acharya left Russia, never to return. They first settled in Berlin, and the Russian Berlin of the 1920s is yet another topic of my book. Magda's experience in Berlin was unusual for a refugee from Russia in that she mingled not only with uh, Russian emigres, but with the Indian immigrant community as well. Shortly after her arrival in Berlin, Magda met the Nabokov family and became, in fact, a close friend of the family. In 1933, Magda produced pastel portraits of Vladimir, his wife Vera, and his mother, Yelena Ivanovna. Magda's is one of only two known portraits of Vladimir Nabokov from his um, Berlin years. Um, in 1934, Acharya and Magda managed to obtain papers that allowed them to live temporarily in Switzerland and France. And after a years long struggle to obtain documents that would allow them to settle somewhere permanently, Acharya was finally allowed to return to India. And the year 1936 finds Magda and Acharya in Bombay, their last home where Magda became a part of the vibrant Bombay artistic community. India was an unusual place for European refugees in the interwar years, only a small number of whom were allowed to enter the country. Americans will be familiar with the fact that um, quite a few uh, European refugees to the United States uh, before the Second World War contributed greatly to their new country's culture. Similarly, Magda brought new ideas of art to India and encouraged um, artistic experimentation among her younger Indian colleagues. By the end of her life, Magda 
um, was um, had become a noted and well-loved painter and was lionized as the grand little lady of the Bombay art world. And here are some examples of her Indian um, works uh, produced after her immigration there. Um, as as um, uh, I, I, I showed you mostly portraiture, but, but she was a prolific um, painter of many, in many genres. So um, in conclusion, I would like to say that Magda was raised at a time and um, a social class that promised her a life of comfort and stability. But the 20th century had other ideas and Magda spent her adult life in poverty and largely on the run, so to speak. They say that life, if life gives you lemons, you should simply make lemonade, uh, but that is often easier said than done. Like many of her era, Magda Nachman was handed a large plate of bitter fruit and out of it, she created an art that is original, compelling, and in its depiction of its human and even animal subjects, deeply moving. Thank you. That was so wonderful. And I'm, I love this image. This is such a beautiful image. And actually, um, I have more questions that have come up in my uh, mind. But we could start with this one, which is, um, you know, the book is richly illustrated and I Magda was forgotten. So it is so interesting to me to think about where you found the images, how you collected them. And this one, if I remember correctly, is actually reproduced from a Bombay catalog that originally it was Correct. perhaps not even black and white. It's a black yeah. and white photograph well, of a painting. The, in the catalog, it, it is black and white. Right. But the but the painting is lost. It's lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, every painting uh, I showed you has a story behind it uh, of um, how I found it and how it came into my can and into the book. Uh, and I can tell you a few stories. Um, so we, we can start with those images I have here. Um, this is, uh, you're right, Angela, it's, it's coming from a catalog of the Bombay Art Society uh, in which um, uh, which produced uh, catalogs for the exhibitions and Magda participated in those exhibitions uh, right uh, from the start when she came to, to Bombay. Um, unfortunately, the reproductions are black and white, but even here in this uh, not great reproduction, you can see the play of light. Um, and you can only imagine yeah, it's probably a watercolor, which is also difficult to say. Uh, and uh, it, it's a typical place which I think I know where it is, uh, not far from Magda's uh, home uh, in Bombay where she uh, settled, uh, finally. Um, excuse me, uh, the previous picture mm. came to me uh, from quite a different source. Uh, so when my name started appearing uh, on the uh, internet uh, in connection, in conjunction with Magda's name, and also after I uh, constructed a website for Magda's pictures where I collect everything I could find, some people started finding me uh, and asking about Magda because they had pictures by her uh, and didn't know much about who she was just as I didn't know at first when I just started, the only picture I knew was the portrait of Tsvetaeva and that was it. I didn't know anything else. So this picture comes from um, a person who lives in uh, UK, I believe in Scotland, and who has four of Magda's pictures uh, brought back by his parents, both of whom worked for many years uh, in Bombay. And that is another um, avenue by which I find pictures. Uh, when people find me, uh, uh, because their parents came back with what they bought in Bombay. Uh, right now, I'm in search of another um, uh, 
pile, I, I hope, of pictures by Magda in Sweden. Uh, I know for sure that um, Bombay Consul bought many of her pictures and brought back to Sweden. And so now uh, I'm, I'm still continue, uh, continue um, looking for those pictures. This picture is a, a marvelous example of um, Magda's draftsmanship for which uh, she had been praised in many, many reviews uh, in uh, Bombay papers. Uh, uh, so it's a sitting, squatting boy. This picture, uh, which in the reviews is called well known or known by everyone, but not to us, it's lost. Uh, the only image I could find is from a paper. It's a um, very uh, pixeled, but uh, still we have an image of what it could have been. Uh, and it's a big picture, sizable picture, it was exhibited several times um, in Bombay uh, in the exhibitions. This picture was found by its owner on the street from a street seller. Uh, he was passing by and saw this picture on the ground and bought it. This picture was bought by uh, the present owner uh, from uh, a picture gallery, uh, which was closing. And um, the owner uh, of the gallery uh, thought uh, very highly of Magda. Uh, and I write about him in, in the book. Um, so you, you see there are different ways of uh, pictures uh, getting to me. Um, so this is India, and the majority of the uh, pictures I found are in India. Um, I, I can, if I may, I don't know how much time we have, but um, there is a, a funny story I can tell you about one particular picture. It's, uh, I don't have it here, it's a landscape. Uh, so I, I was visiting a museum in Bombay um, and I was going from one room to another, not really knowing what I was looking for. And um, all of a sudden I found myself in a room which said uh, Tibetan art. And uh, at the entrance, there was a note that that was a collection by Liga Tani. Liga Tani is Magda's close friend. And I had been looking for her for a year before that, um, uh, hoping to find letters, uh, correspondence between them. So I immediately went to uh, the uh, director of the museum, to the curators, to the offices. No one could tell me where this collection came from, who donated it, how it happened to be there. And um, I must say, it's very difficult to come upon archives in uh, Indian museums. Uh, one director of a different museum, when I asked about archives said, what archive? We don't do history. So uh, that evening uh, I was at a, a small dinner party uh, at, an, at, at a place uh, who, uh, whose owner, um, oh, excuse me, whose, uh, uh, the, the hostess, owned um, a, a picture by Magda, her, actually her father's portrait. And I was bitterly complaining about having come so close to Ligatani and not being able to determine where she is and where this came from. And lo and behold, the hostess says, well, I, I'm a relative of Ligatani. And uh, the, the other guest said, oh, I went to school with her niece. I can connect you. And the niece lived in Pune, uh, not too far from Bombay. So next day I went to Pune and met this niece and learned so many stories about Liga Tani uh, and Magda, who really spent time together. And um, the niece had one picture by Magda, uh, which I reproduce in, in, in the book. So, that's how I, I came upon the pictures in India by, by chance. There was a chain of people who sent me to someone they knew and then another one and then another one. And that's how it came all together, all, all the pictures I have from India. Now in Germany is quite a different matter. 
everything disappeared in Germany. And she was very prolific. The, uh, she had a solo exhibition for which Nabokov wrote a review uh, naming or uh, giving us several ti titles. Yeah, where are these pictures? Um, not clear. And even uh, Nabokov's portrait uh, survives only in a photograph because they left, uh, um, the Nabokovs left their documents and pictures and photos uh, with uh, a friend in Paris and uh, the friend disappeared and everything else disappeared. After the war, they tried um, to find the portraits uh, they advertised in the Russian newspapers, uh, but to no avail. And um, the saddest thing, of course, is Russia, because she um, was very prolific and she um, exhibited and we know the titles, we, we have lists of her um, pictures, the titles of her pictures, but where are these pictures? Uh, I can show you one picture uh, which survives in Russia. I have to go through quickly through all, everything I showed you. This picture mm. um, is now on display in, in, in the traffic of gallery. Uh, it's a part of the um, exhibition brought to Russia from Kazan. Uh, from uh, the um, Art Museum of the Republic of Tatars Tatarstan in, in Kazan, um, where a number of avant-garde um, artists um, brought their pictures, that is not the artists themselves, but those pictures were brought there um, uh, within the program of the art to the masses in 1920. And they were left there um, and uh, this picture survived miraculously, and I um, write about this in, in the book as well. It was almost destroyed, but now it's their prize, color, prize um, item. Uh, and it was exhibited also in uh, 2016 uh, in the Russian Museum uh, in the show uh, The um, Circle of Petrov Vodkin. But apart from this uh, known picture by now um, in a museum, uh, there are a few pictures in, in um, uh, Museum of uh, uh, Marina Tsvetaeva, uh, which are not displayed, they're just in the archive, and in the archive of um, State Literary Museum in Moscow. Uh, I heard there is uh, a, a a picture, a, a, a landscape in um, Voloshin House in Koktebel. Uh, I didn't have any success corresponding with them somehow. Um, but that's about it in, in Russia. So I hope when my book, by, by the way, my book is out in, in Russia as of um, a few weeks ago. Um, so when, when it is more known in, in Russia. I hope to find some more pictures. I have to say that, you know, when I think about Magda and her, her date of birth, so she's born in 1889, which makes her almost an exact contemporary of Hadasevich, Vladislav Hadasevich, who also left in 1922, and who had a life you know, a little bit like Magda, that he, after the revolution, tried to engage with prolet cult and he gave lectures and he tried to be a part of, you know, tried to make a living and be a part of the post-revolutionary art scene or literary scene, uh, and then realized that he, he needed to leave in 1922. And, and so in some ways he really parallels her. And at the same time, I think about um, Vladimir Nabokov, who, uh, also, who left in, in 1919, I think, uh, and uh, was in England by 22 uh, in school, but who nonetheless, in a, in a funny way, you know, had that same St. Petersburg upbringing that should have uh, given him a golden life. And unlike Magda, well, like Magda, went to Europe, but then unlike Magda, went to the United States. So that, that in some ways, her destination in India both saved many paintings and saved uh, her work in the way that it would not have been had she stayed in Germany or indeed oh. in Russia, uh, but at the same time buried her. Uh, nobody remembered her 
um, just, and she had a kind of an opposite experience to Nabokov, who in Russian language and in English language uh, history uh, made a big, big name for himself. So it's fascinating uh, to think about, and, and I, I already brought this up again in our private conversation that uh, Hadesevich was a biographer. Um, lots of people in the 1920s turned to biography, and he wrote a biography and believed very of, of Dejavin, of the of the Russian 18th century poet. But he believed very strongly in what he called this this life to death narrative arc. So when we think about how you construct a biography, um, Hadesevich thought that it was in some ways um, the narrative arc was given to you. You meet up with a, hmm. a, a, a character who has a history, but who is dead, long dead in many cases. And you use that narrative arc that is given to you. Nabokov, of course, did the opposite. Uh, when Nabokov wrote the biography of, um, well, when he wrote the biography of Gogol, he started from the end. He said, you know, he starts it with Gogol's death. Uh, and similarly, you start your biography with Magda's obituary and with your gradually coming to figure out what her path was uh, and how she ended up uh, in Bombay. Um, so uh, the, the construction of the biography is, of course, as a scholar of biography, is one of the things I'm, I'm most interested in. Um, but when we talk more about these beautiful paintings, um, and about their existence in some cases in these provincial museums. Uh, that's another project I would love to do is to explore um, some of the paintings that ended up almost accidentally in provincial museums. I have a, a fantasy about a, a project on Rockwell Kent, uh, who is- You would fit in with what is going on in Russia right, right now. I, I Tell me more about this. I mean, the Zvantseva Art School, of course, is fascinating. And you know, my, my first encounter with Leon Box was not through the Ballet Russe, which it should have been, but rather through the Baltimore um, house Yes. Uh, the Evergreen, uh, Evergreen, where he uh, decorated a theater uh, and uh, for the for the owner of that house. Um, but but learning about these other women artists in particular, um, but just the artistic circles of the pre-revolutionary era uh, and post-revolutionary is fascinating. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about those uh, empty lost uh, those empty spaces that of lost artistic figures who are now uh, being rediscovered. Um, I, I actually, um, in anticipation uh, of a question mm. like that, or in hope to bring this <laughs> about, I prepared this slide just to show you a few titles of the a few names of the exhibitions uh, which have been going on in uh, Russia. Uh, the um, I would say that. Uh, we should be thankful to uh, Andrei Dmitrievich Sarabianov for many of those exhibitions, which um, uh, he him himself mounted or inspired um, to be um, mounted. Uh, so uh, you, you can see um, all, all the titles here. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, solo exhibitions of Sergei Kolmakov, Nadezhda Lermontova, and Julia Abalenska, all uh, students of the Zvantsova uh, school, uh, who uh, Sergei Kalmukov uh, came, uh, his, his name appeared a few, a, a little bit earlier, Nadezhda Lermontova, um, first exhibition after her death uh, in 1921, uh, was um, in Moscow in uh, 2018. Uh, and Julia Balenska, uh, it is a very interesting story how her exhibition came about because her pictures uh, were in the state um, literary museum and they were given uh, to uh, the Center for Restoration of Icons and Old Pictures as a test material for chemicals. And someone just saw that uh, <laughs> there were pictures, and it, it was the the end. Um, I, I don't remember the year exactly, but the end of the uh, 1940s or the beginning of the 1950s, and just put these pictures in, in a drawer. And recently, in 2016, someone found these pictures, restored them, and exhibited. And the exhibition uh, was rather loud. The curators were 
uh, interviewed on the on the state television in Moscow, and uh, I, I was very lucky uh, to be there at the time. Although the exhibition was over, but the curators showed me every picture and how they restored that, and um, so. Uh, this is what is going on in, in Russia. It's, it's, it, it's very exciting. Now, uh, the shows which are underway now are absolutely mind boggling. This story avant garde in a wagon into the 21st century, which mm -hmm. is mounted by Sarabyanov um, and his team um, in Yekaterinburg. Uh, well, she found these pictures which were brought in a small place, he even doesn't say what place, but some godforsaken, I must say, place um, uh, for showing, for showing to, to the people. And he found Kandinsky, unknown pictures by Kandinsky, Malevich, and many more illustrious names in this exhibition. It, it, it was like from from the different world to to find um, to find pictures like that, and now this exhibition is going on. Um, masterpieces from Kazan I mentioned where Magda's picture is shown. Same thing. The pictures were sent there in 1920, and uh, some of them had very tragic fate, some disappeared, but some were preserved. Uh, as Magda said about her herself, miraculously, miraculously preserved. And now they're on display in, in the Tretikov Gallery in Moscow. So it, it's a vibrant field, I, I think, and very promising because pictures were sent to the provinces and to find them is very exciting. Well, and that's in some ways, uh, you know, it seems like you were, you found this trove of people. Um, again, it's such a timely biography because you were able to find Magda's niece and other relatives uh, and other people who knew people who knew people still around and still having these pictures in India and in the UK. Um, it feels like it's so timely because if you had been coming at this project 50 years later, those people wouldn't have those stories to tell anymore. Exactly. Um, at the same time, you know, we can say that that India is that, that we are lucky that she was in India, um, that she survived. Obviously, she survived World War II by being in India in great part. Um, she uh, was able to prosper and to have students and colleagues. Um, but when we think about, so maybe things are lost from Europe. Uh, like the Nabokov family papers and portraits and collections. Um, but maybe Russia is the place where we will continue to unearth more and more, especially in these provincial museums. I think that they are a rich, um, a rich source of uh, a treasure trove yeah, of forgotten awesome. art and forgotten uh, pictures. Yeah. Or in private collections and in private collections that's the other thing and and again so the what the when I was reading the biography I'm fascinated by her uh, by Magda's trip to you know escape to Germany and her escape really to India just in time um, but I was fascinated particularly about the 1920s the early 1920s when she is living in places and all she writes about is I can't have I need paper I need supplies. I can't survive without creating this art and I can't even do the teaching I'm supposed to do because I don't have the supplies. That stuff was fascinating. And can you, I don't know if, if you know, we've talked a lot about where the images came from, but maybe you could talk more uh, just briefly about where the letters and other physical documents that you found that helped you recreate her story and yeah. her life. Certainly. Um, I just want to, to add about the materials which she was looking for. In Germany, for example, most of the pictures which she um, exhibited were, were done in pastel. And I, I think uh, they lived, he, she and her husband lived in one room in a big apartment with other people. Uh, there was no place for her to do anything else. No oil. And oil 
uh, is expensive. You need canvas, you need uh, other materials for oil. So mainly it was pastel and she was poor all her life, all her life. She was very, very poor. Um, so uh, about, um, About the, the provinces in the 1920s. Uh, the provinces, uh, could you repeat your question? So I was interested in where, you know, so I know that you had the correspondence between Yulia oh, yes. and Magda, but where else, what other documents and what other archives or letters or uh, paper okay. evidence did you find to help you reconstruct this this, this path the, of your life? Uh, the the, 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 uh, the um, uh, provincial life, you, you mean? At this point. Yes, uh, the great source uh, was uh, the local paper uh, called Mollet. Uh, 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 I, I couldn't stop quoting it in my book and in, in the Russian version I quote much <laughs> longer passages um, because I didn't have to translate them into English and uh, uh, they are very vivid. They really describe uh, what Magda lived through, her surroundings, uh, the language was floating around her. You, you are reminded of Platonov very much uh, with this uh, kind of, of paper language. Um, then uh, there were archival materials about people who surrounded her. Well, one big name was, of course, Mikhail Bakhtin, who was a, a, in the neighboring town. Uh, near her and all of uh, the uh, lectures which um, uh, he organized and concerts, uh, Magda saw many of those. And um, that was rather uh, comparatively easy to find. But other people with whom he, she was um, friendly, uh, her um, uh, friends at schools, teaching at schools who were also refugees from mainly Petersburg, you can find um, in local uh, local uh, history museums, uh, some documents, some documents at uh, local provincial archives uh, around this area. Uh, and uh, they give you a flavor of those people, who they were and what happened with them afterwards. Uh, I, I, I still uh, have one outstanding uh, information I want uh, to, to find about Naskov, uh, her maybe uh, closest friend uh, in, in, in her time in, um, when she was a, 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 an art um, designer for, for the theater in the village. Uh, but um, it's also a, a, a great source of information. And the letters, of course, come mostly from uh, Yulia Balenska archive, uh, which is also amazing how she uh, managed to preserve. Unfortunately, um, she probably destroyed letters uh, from Germany, mm -hmm. uh, from abroad, because uh, there is evidence in her letters to Magda uh, that Magda was also writing to her. Uh, but I have a few letters which Yulia wrote to Magda and uh, saved by uh, Magda's relatives in Switzerland, uh, but nothing in Yulia's archive. Um, and she was very particular about saving every scrap of paper, but not those which would compromise her in the 1930s in Russia, of course, a uh, usual story. Well, again, I just, I just have to say that I'm so impressed with the threads uh, that you pulled together from all over the world, really, uh, to make this biography. It is a masterful uh, collection of information, of stories, of pictures uh, that really brings Magda back to life. Uh, in a way. And so it, and it's so exciting, of course, for Academic Studies Press to be able to also publish it in Russian so that we can give her uh, two lives in English and in Russian. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lena and Angela, so much for joining me. And um, if you're watching, then Lena's book is available both in English and in Russian from Academic Studies Press. You can buy it on our website academicstudiespress.com or wherever you buy your books. Thanks for watching. <laughs>